In the first episode of Paris Cachet, we saw a structure used for observation. In the last episode, we saw a sort of private enclave at the edge of medieval Paris. In this next episode, we'll be venturing to the third arrondissement to uncover a site which has elements of both of these previous themes, but with a completely different story to tell. One of royal intrigues, love affairs, assassinations, and a bomb. Remember what I constantly advise you to do. Always keep your eyes peeled. Stay observant. But who's observing you? Ready to go find out? You might want to bring along your sword. Or, better yet, full order of knights. Things are about to get dangerous. These days, dangerous would hardly be the word one would use to describe the serene marais. This right-bank neighborhood, extending north of Ile Saint-Louis and the Seine River to Place de la République, and from Bastille west to châtelet Leal, is dotted with pretty squares and elegant Renaissance-era private mansions. But... It wasn't always so picturesque. As I touched on in the last episode, the city on the right bank of the Seine was developed much later than the left bank. Part of the reason for this was that the land now comprising the third and fourth arrondissements was very wet, which is how it got its nickname, Le Marais, the French word for marsh. As the right bank gradually developed over the course of medieval times, it was decided to dredge this swampy land in the 12th century, which was then converted into mostly farmland and orchards. At the end of the same century, King Philippe Auguste built his great wall around the then much smaller Paris, which we discussed in the last episode. This wall encompassed only about half of the current-day 4th district, and none of the 3rd. In addition to farmland, the peripheral zone beyond the city wall in this area also had a few monasteries, the walled enclave of the Knights Templar, and a few noble properties. Virtually nothing remains of any of these medieval complexes today. Well, save for a few small relics, mostly in the form of street names. However, there is a remnant of one of these noble homes that is particularly interesting, one which you've possibly walked past while strolling in the marae. Perhaps it even caught your eye and made you wonder for a split second what it might be. It's found on the corner of Rue des Francs Bourgeois and Rue Vieille de Temple, hidden in plain sight. A small tower. A watchtower. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In the early 1300s, Etienne Barbet, the Prévois des Marchands de Paris, the head of the local authority body I mentioned in the last episode, decided to build a walled enclave for himself, just outside the city wall over in this area. Called the Courtille Barbette, it roughly occupied the land now framed by Rue Vieille de Temple, Font Bourgeois, Payenne and Parc Royal. Originally designed as a simple country home within a large walled estate, was gradually embellished into one of the area's most beautiful and prestigious residences. Barbet too rose in prestige, eventually becoming the financial advisor to King Philippe le Bel 
and the master of the French mint. This might have meant increased power and wealth for Barbet, but it also instigated some trouble for him. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now back to Paris Cachet. Danger. Watch out, Barbet. On December 16th, 1306, an angry mob, sparked by a tripling of taxes which they blamed on Barbet, raided his property. They cut down all of its trees and ransacked his home. Ouch! Furious, the king responded by condemning to death 26 of the rioters, who were hung at each of the city's gates, including the gate located right across from Barbette's property, which took on the name of La Porte Barbette. There must have also been one hanging from the Saint-Denis gate, mentioned in the previous episode. Yikes! Gruesome and dangerous times indeed. After Barbette died in 1321, I don't believe as a result of another angry mob, the house passed through the hands of different high-level nobles. But the Barbette name stuck, and the house carried on being referred to as the Hotel Barbette. The fate of the Marais was also shifting over the course of the 14th century. France itself was in flux at the time. In 1337, the Hundred Years' War broke out. More than a century of disputes between the French, English, and internal noble factions over the sovereignty of the country. In 1360, King Charles V broke with the royal tradition of living at the Conciergerie Palace, located on Ile de la Cité, by moving to a new, safer royal castle complex on the right bank. The reason for this move was also linked to money, and yet another angry mob. Two years earlier, when Charles was the Dauphin, the royal son first in line to the throne, Etienne Marcel, a later head of the Prévois des Marchands, and his cronies, stormed the conciergerie, triggered by more rising tensions over increased taxes. Right in front of the prince's terrified eyes, they slit the throats of several of his advisors. Well, that's one way to get what you want. These were the same guys who'd forced the managers of L'Hôpital de la Trinité from the last episode to relinquish some of their land for that cemetery. Had they used the same strong-arm tactics on them? Now I can see why they gave in to the Prévost's demands for that cemetery. Understandably concerned about his safety and to better be able to watch his back, Charles V chose to expand on some property the royals already owned south of Corti Barbet, near Saint Paul des Champs, the Saint Paul of the Fields Church located within the Saint-Martial Monastery complex and a church which predated and stood nearby the current Saint-Louis-Saint-Paul church. Its proximity to the church gave the royal estate its name, L'Hôtel de Saint-Paul. The complex had a strategic location on the east edge of the city which meant the king could easily escape to the Vincennes fortress in case of attack from the English or the rough and tough Prévois de Paris, something which was much harder to do over at the Conciergerie. At the same time, he also decided to renovate the Louvre fortress, 
to make it into a more comfortable royal residence, leading to it later becoming the main royal residence in Paris. Since the Hôtel de Saint-Paul was outside of the city walls, it needed to be protected. For this, the king did not simply build a wall around this complex, he decided to expand the whole city wall on the right bank, which was mentioned in our last episode. This way, the king would be safer and the city could also grow in size. As part of this new defensive system, he added the Bastille Fortress, conveniently located right next to his palace complex. This was the starting point of his new wall, which stretched north to what is now Place de la République, and then over to the west, beyond the Louvre. So, what does all of this have to do with the Corti Barbette, besides it now having some even more prestigious neighbours? Hold on, I'm getting to that. Charles V's successor, his son Charles VI, carried on living at L'Hôtel de Saint-Paul. In 1389, his wife, through an arranged marriage, Isabeau de Bavière, arrived from her native land of Bavaria in Paris in 1389 by way of a grand entrée triomphale a triumphant entry through the Port Saint-Denis, as described in episode 2, accompanied by 1,300 knights who protected her along her journey in those terribly dangerous times. Bright and lively, the Queen famously threw magnificent royal celebrations and started the trend of masked balls. Perhaps she did this as a distraction from her husband, who, shortly after her arrival in Paris, began exhibiting erratic and insane behavior. Today, he would likely have been diagnosed with schizophrenia. It certainly wouldn't have been easy living with a mad king down at the Hotel de Saint-Paul. So, in 1401, the queen moved out to the Hotel Barbette. She did still see the king, and over the course of their marriage, she somehow managed to produce 12 royal children, although many died young. But perhaps all of those children weren't his. These weren't great times to have a crazy king on the throne of France. Remember, the country was in the midst of the Hundred Years' War. As nutty as her husband was, Isabeau had a good head on her shoulders and was even named head of the Regency Council of the Dauphin a small committee responsible for the care, education, and ultimately governance until the boy was of age to become king, a role which granted her substantial power and political sway. She even acted as a mediator for the disputes between the rival French noble factions, stoking the political turmoil of the times. However, as we've already seen, Those in a position of power are easy targets to criticism, and Isabeau was no exception. There were many plots and accusations revolving around the Queen. One of these purported that she was having an affair with the King's own brother, Louis, the Duke of Orleans. This might have just been the gossip of the times, but they were spending quite a lot of time together, 
and working on high-level issues of state, including taxation, which we have also seen can spark a considerable amount of trouble and danger. Watch out, Isabeau and Louis. A high-level aristocrat, Jean de Bourgogne, the Duke of Burgundy, was particularly angry about the loss of revenue incited by new tax measures brought in by Louis and Isabeau. He was so angry that in August 1405, and with the help of a thousand of his knights, he ambushed the carriages of Isabeau, Louis, and the royal children. He kidnapped the Dauphin and held him hostage until another upper echelon noble, the Duc de Berry, offered to take charge of the Dauphin as a neutral party. Tensions continued to be high between the Dukes of Burgundy and Orleans, and they would only get worse. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Paris Cachet. On the 10th of November, 1407, over at the Hotel Barbette, Isabeau gave birth to her last child, a boy, who was sadly premature and did not survive. Isabeau was naturally devastated by this, and a few weeks later, on the night of November 23rd, the Duke of Orleans came to console her. Just by coincidence? Or could he have been the father of the deceased child? Jean de Bourgogne was tipped off about Louis's visit and seized the opportunity. He had the king's valet go to the Hotel Barbette to claim that the king urgently needed to see his brother. Upon leaving the premises, a large mob of Jean's henchmen were waiting to attack Louis. When they lunged at him, axes and swords in hand, Louis apparently cried out, But I'm the Duke of Orleans. And the mob replied, That's exactly who we're after. And then proceeded to hack poor Louis to death. Jeez, those angry mobs. The revolutionary spirit had been brewing in France way before the outbreak of the Revolution of 1789. The spot where the attack on Louis happened is thought to be down the tiny lane called L'Impasse des Albetières, a narrow lane just off of Rue Fontbourgeois, where the Swiss Institute is currently located. A city plaque found at the lane's entrance describes this terrible event. It isn't surprising that this gruesome incident prompted the queen to move out of the Hotel Barbette. But the site's history and intrigue doesn't stop with Isabeau's departure. What happened to that watchtower I mentioned earlier? Something which could have been extremely useful in preventing the Duke of Orleans' death. The first few decades of the next century saw some further happenings and fascinating residences at the property. Around 1510, part of the land of the Corti Barbette was acquired by Jean Herouet, the former secretary of a subsequent Duke of Orleans, who would go on to become King Louis the Twelfth. Jean Arrow's status also increased with the crowning of this new king, who named Arouet as his minister of finance. On his land, he decided to build a red brick and stone mansion in the late Gothic style. On the corner of the building, he added a special feature, an achouguette, an overhanging wall-mounted turret that is found on some late medieval, early modern buildings. 
This is the small watchtower I've been alluding to. Quite charming, it has flamboyant gothic decorative motifs, a turreted roof, and, of course, windows for spying. Little did Arroway know that in a mere few decades, the corner the tower was built on would become one of the most happening intersections in all of Paris. Shortly afterwards, the Hotel Barbette changed hands yet again, this time into those of the de Brézé family. Louis de Brézé was the Grand Seneschal de Normandy, a high-ranking aristocrat who would stand in for the regional duke when he was absent. Although that was an important title, it was his wife who became more important, much more important. She was Diane de Poitiers, the influential and long-standing mistress of King Henry II, the husband of Catherine de' Medici, the royal figures who starred in the first episode. Diane had various homes, However, she would have spent a considerable amount of time at the Hotel Barbet, and most likely received the king here. I hope he brought his royal guards with him when he did, so he did not meet the same fate as Louis of Orleans when he visited his supposed mistress, Queen Isabeau, at the same location. Nevertheless, you may recall that Henry also died a tragic death, the one predicted by Nostradamus, due to injuries sustained a mere few blocks from this spot. A jousting lance to the eye. As I said, always keep your eyes peeled. Naturally, despite her power, Diane also had to watch out. After Henri's impromptu death, Catherine de' Medici swiftly exiled her husband's mistress to a castle in the Loire Valley, so she wouldn't have spent much time at Hotel Barbet after 1559. As the royals and high-level nobles were spending more and more time in the Marais, other aristocrats also wanted to use the area as their base in Paris. This became possible as of 1545, the day when the priory of St. Catherine du Val des Écoliers, a monastery which owned a good chunk of the Marais land, began selling off plots. I don't think any strong arming was involved this time, like at the Hôpital de la Trinité. Instead, the monastery nicely filled its coffers, and the marais filled with dozens upon dozens of Renaissance-style private mansions that the district is so famous for today. And the Courtille Barbet was right in the center of it all. Such a prime location, but the 250-year-old home was hardly in vogue and the vast swath of land was so tempting. Consequently, the Hotel Barbet was torn down in 1563 to make way for Rue de Barbet, Rue Elsevier, and Rue du Parc Royal, which quickly populated with more of the time's modern mansions. However, since it was newer, the Hotel Héroë was spared the demolition ball. And it was suddenly at the most exciting intersection in Paris's most fashionable neighborhood. Imagine all of the exciting comings and goings, which could be observed from our little watchtower. In fact, in the 1620s, Charles de Valois added a similar Echoguette when he built an extension onto his mansion, the Hotel de la Moignon, located two blocks down on the same street. While you're walking in the area, look out for this one, too. 
In 1582, the Hôtel Héroé was bought by Nicolas Pelloquin, the secretary of King Henry III. The troubles associated to finance, which were linked to the location, seemed to be haunting it, because poor Nicolas went bankrupt in 1621 and had to sell the mansion. It was then split into two parts. The west side, home to the cute watchtower, was bought by Jean-Baptiste Brunet de Chailly, an advisor to King Louis XIII, and hopefully a better manager of personal finance. Nevertheless, this was perhaps the start of the decline of the former courtier Barbette. In the early 1700s, the Marais fell out of fashion, and the aristocrats mostly abandoned it for the then trendier Faubourg Saint-Germain and Faubourg Saint-Honoré districts. After the French Revolution, most of the Marais' mansions fell into a dismal state, and many of the historic buildings were turned into workshops, while others were simply destroyed. That was set to be the fate of the Hôtel Héroé, which was going to be torn down in the early 1890s in order to expand the size of the intersection. Fortunately, it was instead bought up and saved by Henri Delmagne, a member of the Old Paris Commission who succeeded to have it classified as a National Heritage Building in 1908. It seemed like the gods, or at least the spirit of Etienne Barbette, were watching over and protecting the site. However, something else from the sky would have it otherwise. The Corti Barbette's last remaining building had survived the wrecking ball several times, only to be massively damaged by bombings on the night of August 26-27, 1944, in the aftermath of the liberation of Paris. But not all of it was destroyed by that bomb. Our watchtower miraculously survived and still watches over this crossroads. For a time, the remains of the building sat in partial ruins, but it was finally, although not very successfully, restored in the 1970s. So, the next time you're in the Marais, keep a lookout, especially when you reach the crossroads of Vieille du Temple and Front Bourgeois. The ground floor of the mansion might now be a clothing store, but look up to spot the tower and keep your hand on your sword. To have an idea of what the Corti Barbette might have looked like, take a wander down the nearby Rue des Archives, where you can still see the partial remains of another mansion of the era, the entrance to the former Hôtel de Clisson, built in 1375 and sticking out of the Hotel de Subis, now the National Archives, or extend your stroll to the Southern Array, where you can see the Hotel de Sens, built shortly before the Hotel Héroé. And in the meantime, stay on the lookout. You never know what you might come across in Paris. your host, Lily Heisey. You can find me at jetemmeneither.com. Our theme music is Dreamer, produced by Dania Vodavaz. Additional music used in this episode includes Queen of the Celts by Ian Grimm and Messiah by Handel, performed by the Holy Angel Choir. Paris Caché is produced by Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show, and shows like it, please go to parisundergroundradio.com. <laughs>